if you are ready, so we, we move on to, uh, so we have studied the Maxwell equations. And uh, remember, we, uh, if, you, if you remember, it's, we, we split them in two sets uh, by uh, studying the static limits. And actually, that uh, uh, gave rise to electrostatics, that is a, a rather <coughs> important subject, uh, mainly because uh, it, it's a very apparent force. I mean, uh, we, we, we do have uh, electrostatic forces around. If you have free charges, then uh, the, the leading effect is uh, this uh, big uh, Coulomb uh, field, right? Um, and that's the reason why in the textbooks uh, this electrostatics chapter, chapter uh, is, or chapters uh, are uh, much longer than the, one, the corresponding one for the magnetostatics. I mean, magnetostatics is sort of, I mean, people knew about these weird materials, right, uh, that uh, from magnesia in, in Greece, uh, but magne no, not magnesia, magne some, the name comes from the name of this town that uh, attracted the uh, metallic particles, right? Uh, and then if you, if you, you know, if you, if you, uh, if you stroke some uh, of these amber materials, then uh, uh, it, 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 it becomes, you know, that's probably from electrostatics, yeah. Uh, so, but the, 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 there is no everyday manifestation of this, except for this uh, ferromagnetic uh, materials, right? Uh, uh, and therefore, as we move to the next uh, 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 set of uh, uh, um, Maxwell equation for uh, um, magnetostatics, I, I think we, we can do it rather quickly and move on to the full set of Maxwell equations. But just uh, there are a few things that one can, can do here. Uh, and so uh, let me remind you that uh, we have this uh, set in which uh, we study the curl of B. This is the curl of B. It comes from uh, some uh, uh, electric current that you have around. Uh, so if you have a density of charge uh, or, or density of current J, uh, this uh, produces some uh, uh, curl of the B field. That means if you go around doing your uh, line integral around some current, uh, then uh, you find out that the, there is a, a field, there is a magnetic field, I mean. And so light charges uh, generate uh, uh, electrostatic fields, uh, currents. You understand these are st steady currents. I mean, this, this is a current that is there, and it remains at that value. I mean, it's not a varying uh, electric current. So if you have this current, like in a wire, like uh, the one uh, 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 producing this light, uh, then uh, if you go around in your, uh, with your integral, you will discover that uh, there is a B field, a non-vanishing B field. So steady, steady uh, electric currents produce, uh, produce uh, uh, magnetic fields. And then uh, uh, it's always true, this is true also uh, uh, if you have varying uh, fields, that uh, there are no magnetic monopoles, and therefore, uh, if you do uh, a surface integral, uh, you find that uh, uh, the, the, the integration, there is no net flux uh, of uh, B fields out of the closed surface, right? So this is very different, uh, is the main difference with respect to electrostatics, where here you have the divergence of E is proportional to, to how much charges you have inside your volume, okay? But the P field is, uh, is not generated by anything, really. And therefore, if you take a volume integral like this, right, and then you take the surface, uh, the flux of B field, as much as it comes in, it, it comes out, and so you have a vanishing divergence, okay? So this, in a way, we already know. It's always true also, so it's nice, and, and we can forget for the moment, and really the study of magnetostatics come from studying this function uh, uh, in some details. This, this, this thing has a name, it's called Ampere Law, and uh, gives the magnetic field generated by uh, an electric current, okay? 
In a way, I, I prefer the, the integral form, as I said. I mean, if I take, uh, I use uh, uh, Gauss theorem and Stokes theorems, and then I have the, the circuitation of B, right, around some uh, line. <coughs> this is C. I go around, I integrate B. I integrate the component of B along the along this uh, circuit. This is some in integral of this uh, density. And of course, if I integrate this density, uh, I get the current. So you see, I get 1 over epsilon naught uh, uh, c squared, the electric current going through this, uh, this loop. OK, so that's the physical meaning. And remember that this constant is, uh, is, is what we call mu naught, right? So I think properly this is the Ampere's law. So it's the integral form of the Maxwell equation. So if I have some electric current going somewhere and I take a, a circuitation of B around that, I get uh, uh, that uh, the Ampere's law is satisfied. Okay, that's all uh, there is. So the magnetic field induced by a steady current is co you can compute it this way. In fact, we can immediately apply this very simple equation and for, in, for instance what is the magnetic field around a straight wire right that's the, the, the zero order problem you have a wire carrying uh, I don't know I call it uh, yeah I some current okay as probably there is behind this blackboard to, to turn this light on so you have a wire some some constant current uh, I call it I uh, what is the field B in a in certain point uh, here at the certain distance, let's call it R from, from this Y, okay? So that's the simplest problem. It's like the, uh, is the equivalent of the Coulomb, uh, uh, what, what is the electric field generated by a single charge. Here you don't have a magnetic field generated by a single charge, you need charge is moving with constant speed, generating a current. So the, the elementary things that produces a magnetic field is the electric current. So I take electric current, I call it I, the intensity the, the, of this, and then I compute the, the field here. Well, this is very simple because you see, I can just use Ampere's law, right? Uh, so I can say go around at the distance R, I take my circuitation, this C path to be a, a, a circle of radius R around this current, okay? So for instance, I go this way. Then uh, this quantity here, the left-hand side of Ampere's law is what? Well, it's very simple because it's just uh, whatever the B field here, the intensity of the B field there, right? So the B field uh, tangential to, to this line times uh, the, the length of this, uh, uh, of this circumference that, uh, of course, being a, a circumference of radius uh, R has to be 2 pi R, as you discover at the beginning of your uh, geometry class. And because of the Ampere's law, this circuitation around, so this is C, uh, must be mu naught, uh, the ca electric current carried by this wire. So you see, I have, uh, so the, the, the intensity, uh, the size of the B field, so the B field, uh, so this, this is going to be like a, a force line for the B field, right? So there are like circumferences around uh, this field. Uh, and uh, because it's a force line, the, the B field is always tangential to this. So if you do that, and the intensity of, of this field, well, comes from here, right? It's just uh, mu naught divided by 2 pi, 1 over r i. <coughs> and uh, uh, so that's the simplest form of another uh, law that you may find uh, in, in the books, uh, in the textbooks, uh, that is called uh, bio savar
is just one guy. It's not just uh, it's a one guy with one of those guys with the hyphen in the last name. They they are very. It was a French guy. So. Uh, and we will see. I mean, actually, this is the experimental root of this uh, Ampere's law. I mean, they they sort of. Well, it, it, uh, okay, I'll, I'll show you in a second. Experiment, of course, they, 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 how do you measure a B field? You measure through the force that is produced, produced uh, uh, through Lorentz force by the presence of the B field. So this is the simplest expression, this Biot-Savar law. But experimentally, it was really that they had wires, right? Uh, uh, and they had the current running through these wires, and they noticed that the wires were, uh, were uh, attracting one another or, or repelling one another, depending uh, on the direction of the, of the electric current. So that was sort of a random discovery. They were not expecting, uh, I mean, the, the, the legend is that uh, Orsted, this was a Swedish guy, I think, or Norwegian. Uh, was just showing some other stuff, and then he noticed that uh, in the apparatus the two wires were attracting each other, and so he started uh, wondering what was uh, what, uh, and uh, and uh, eventually they wrote this uh, this uh, this Biot-Savar law. So I'll come back to this in a second uh, because in fact I want to to compute the force that you have uh, between two circuits uh, if you have electric currents running. Uh, 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 in the two. So that's the equivalent of the problem of what is the force between two charges, right? Because the elementary object as the charge is for the electrostatics, the car electric current is for the magnetostatic. So if I want to compute the equivalent of, uh, of the Coulomb force between two charges, the equivalent is exactly this, the Ampere's law, the Biot-Savart law, that gives you the force between two electric circuits uh, uh, if you have electric currents running there. But before that, uh, we, so this was a, a very simple example of the application of this uh, Maxwell equations for, for computing the BFI. So the other important example, so this is a simple and uh, in fact important example. And of course the other important example is what is the magnetic field in inside a solenoid. You know what the solenoid is? You, you take a yeah, you take a wire, you, you, no? So you understand that uh, if, if you have a magnetic field for each of those wires, you get uh, some magnetic field like that. If you take a cylinder and you round up many, many turns of a, of a wire, the interesting feature is that you essentially you get a, a constant magnetic field inside. Then outside is sort of not constant. But inside you generate a perfect uh, constant magnetic field, and what is the intensity of this magnetic field? Again, it's very easy to compute just by using Ampere's law, because l let me take the, the solenoid, okay, and cut it uh, across uh, 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 like this. So these little dots are the wires, right, that I've cut. So you have the wires going around, and I cut it uh, orthogonally like this. You understand, right? So these are, this is the wire that goes like this. I cut it like that. And as I said, you expect the, the inside the solenoid you have a constant mag magnetic field like that. So uh, the only question is uh, which I, you have to pick. You have to be clever and pick a, a, a wise uh, path for your integral. And this would be something like this. You take a go. Uh, it has to include some of the wires because if there is no wires cut. Uh, by the surface defined by this uh, path, then uh, you get zero, right? So you go around like this, and you include a, a certain number of wires. So this is going to be my C in this case. So let's say this is a, a length L. So you understand that uh, uh, by doing this, right, you get uh, uh, what? Uh, here you have the magnetic field. Now, now take this very small, and outside of an infinitely long solenoid, you have zero magnetic field. So this, this path, it, it, it has a non-vanishing contribution only from here. So you get this B, let's call it B naught, because it's constant. 
times the length of this uh, path, right? And so this is the integral. And this is mu naught or 1 over epsilon 0 c squared, if I take this, the current crossing the surface defined by this. Uh, how much is the current? So I'm running a fixed current I, but through many spires. So I get I times the number of times the, the things go around, so something like this. So if I define little n to be big N divided by L, that is the number of turns, the wires uh, uh, per unit uh, of length, right, little n, then I can write B in a nice form, that is the, the constant B field inside the solenoid defined by this little n, so with the density of, of uh, wiring uh, uh, per unit length given by little n is simply n i divided by this epsilon zero c square or mu naught n i. So that's a, a standard result uh, and it's, as you can see, very easily derived by means of the Ampere's law, that is by means of the of this uh, Maxwell uh, equation for the uh, magnetostatic case. Okay. So that's just to show you that if you give me uh, your current, then uh, if the geometry of the system is sufficiently simple, I can uh, very easily on the back of the of an envelope uh, derive the intensity of the magnetic field uh, uh, generated by that uh, current. But of course, this pure Savar law, as I said, really comes from uh, study the, the force that, uh, that you have uh, when you have a circuit uh, with running uh, currents in them. So let's uh, do a little bit of that. So I want to study a little bit so the bio, Monsieur Bio Savard law says. Let, let me write it for a, for a. This is sort of an integral form. So let me write the, the the differential contribution. So a small, if I take a small uh, section of the wire, okay, crossed by um, with the certain current running, I can write that. Uh, uh, So let me write it like this. Cube. So the views of our law in general, this is for the special case of a single wire like this, in general is given by, by this, okay? Where this K depends on the, uh, so let me now switch to Gauss unit. So this is just one over C if you remember, okay? So if you take it in, like I did, I, I did there, you recover the special case of that I, I computed before for a single wire at the distance r. In general, if you want, this is was an empirical result, but now we we we, we derive it. As I said, there are two ways to 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 do these things. Either you, you build up from results like this and you end up with the Maxwell equations, but I think it's, it's easier the way we are doing it that from the Maxwell equations you derive something like this. Anyway, let's uh, just say that, uh, that, we, that we have uh, this result. So let's put it, so Gauss unit. And uh, uh, what they noticed was that uh, uh, actually what, uh, what they measured was that the force in a certain point R is uh, this uh, one over C, so I over C dS cross B at this point R. So that's what is called Ampere first law. OK, 
okay? So if you are uh, at a certain point R here, uh, the force here is given by the magnetic field. So the force on some small section of a wire carrying a current I is given by the cross product of this small, so you put here the small ds times the magnetic field there. And the magnetic field is generated by some current somewhere else and is given by that. Now, is, is this a, 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 a new result, I mean, from our point of view? No, it must be somehow, I mean, the force, we know that the force is what? The force is Lorentz force. That's the force that you get by putting something charged in an in a, in a electric or magnetic field, a magnetic field in this case. So I must be able to re-derive uh, Lorentz force from this uh, Ampere's first law that was uh, derived experimentally, of course, before the, the, the Lorentz force. But that's the case because uh, it's just a question of taking that this current here, right, that comes from a certain density of charge must be that for a, a just a point charge, right? Let's do that. So if this is for a point charge, that means a, a point charge of charge Q times the velocity, and then I put this very useful function that uh, we already uh, know, that is the Dirac. So this is the current uh, for uh, the current from a point charge. So for us, the, pre the, the, the fundamental concept is the electric charge, the point electric charge. Then the current is derived by saying that uh, you have a current, in fact, you have a density of current if you have a charge moving uh, in space, right, with a certain velocity. Of course, at the time, they didn't know about these charges, this stuff, so for them, this electric current or the density, if you wish, uh, to go to on the local level was the fundamental concept. But for us, uh, if, I, if I now put this in the, in the definition of B, right? So I have my B field because of the Biot-Savart law in, in, at the point R is the integral of these things. Where here, I don't have the macroscopic current, but I have some... Uh, uh, some uh, density of current. And for the density of current, I can pick the one for a point charge. So if I do that, you see that I get Q divided by C. These are just constants, right? Then I have to integrate this density. So I have V, V at the point R uh, prime, where I'm doing the integral, times this, uh, this uh, this uh, R, that is R minus R prime divided by this cube, so R minus R prime cube. And then I get this delta function that is telling me where in space this charge is, this R naught. Okay, so just to, I have uh, in R naught, I have my little charge with velocity v. And I'm looking what happened at the point R where presumably I have a, ma a magnetic field generated by that, okay? And I also have some force. I want to measure the force. And I have to do the, the volume integral on this R prime. But this is uh, a simple because I have this delta function. so. So the integral is uh, killed by the delta function. You just replace everywhere uh, the R prime with the R naught. So you get Q over C. Then the velocity at R naught, so the velocity where the charge is. And then uh, this factor due to the distance between these two points, R and R naught, right? Yeah, times uh, times nothing because I've done. Uh, uh, yeah.
actually probably you recognize this this q times this is what you have a charge q here and you are here i mean the charge is moving so you have an electric current so you have a b field but you see you also have a e field right and in fact that is what it's just a yeah it's just a coulomb field uh, so actually at this I can write as 1 over C V cross E, where E is the, just the, the, the electric field generated by the charge. Actually, this is the first instance of this. You see, you have a, a, a nice relation between B and E for this charge moving. But uh, at the same time, I can compute now the force for, for this B field, right? Again, the force is going to be, force in R is going to be 1 over C. Then you have to do this, uh, so let me replace this uh, I dS by the integral over a volume of the density of current, like I did here, uh, cross uh, the B field uh, in R prime, and I have to integrate over the prime volume. And again, I put uh, the, the, my choice, uh, just the density of current due to this single lonely charge, okay? So I replace this by that. Mm -hmm. And you see that if I do that, I get here Q, V, cross, delta, so not, not cross, uh, times delta R prime minus R naught, right? And like before, the delta, function allows me to do the integral uh, right away, so I get Q over C, V cross B. So the force is equal to this, and this you should be able to recognize right away is exactly the Lorentz force uh, 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 due to a, 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 a magnetic field, okay? So you see, these are, they are not new results. Everything is included in the first blackboard that I wrote down with Maxwell equation plus Lorentz. But uh, in this context, you can rewrite these terms. So at this, we, we let me, uh, uh, so the last thing one can, uh, the next level of generalization is, as I said, let's see what happens if I have two, two uh, electric circuits. So two wires uh, in which you have an electric current running. And what, are, what is the, so let me, so you have two loops like this uh, with the, let me call it, uh, uh, so a I1, and here you have another one with a current I2. And uh, uh, what is the force between these two loops? So you have a current here and the current there. And so, so I, I want to use this Biot-Savart stuff. So I take a DS1 here, okay? So this is at distance R1 and I get a, a DS2 here at the distance R2. So the relative distance, no. the relative distance between these two, I can call it R1 minus R2. Mm -hmm. And the point is that this one will see some B field uh, B, B1, right? And this one, some B field B2 generated or DB, DB1. So this one is the B field generated by this wire. This one is the B field generated by the other one, okay? And because of this B field, they will attract or repulse each other with the force that I'm going to compute. So let's, let's compute it here. Clearly, the force of this on that is exactly equal because of Newton's third law. So let me just compute that. So to compute the force there, first I compute DB2, right? So first I compute the ma magnetic field the infinitesimal magnetic field generated by this infinitesimal section of the wire, and then I apply the force law that I uh, wrote here, 
uh, before, uh, and then, then uh, I erase it, and I, I get the four. So let's do that. So what is the B field? Well, this we already computed. It's just I2 divided by C in Gauss unit, then DS2 uh, cross the distance that in this case is R2, uh, R1 minus R2 divided by the cube. And therefore, the, the force that I call F12, that is the force between these two loops, uh, it, it should be uh, just uh, I1 now, because it's the current running there, divide by C and DS1 cross the field there due to the, uh, that is the, the one I just computed here, OK? So it's just, uh, you see, before I just had one wire, now I have two wires. But uh, So that's really the equivalent of the Coulomb <laughs> force, right? I have two wires with some current and how they, what is the force between these two? Well, so it's just a matter of plugging in, right? So you see it, ca it goes like the product of the current. So it's like divide by C squared. So in a way, this C square, no, C is a big number, you know. It's like uh, 3 times 10 to the 10th uh, uh, centimeter no? uh, per second. So that, in a way, explains why, I mean, this is not, I mean, why the Coulomb force is, is rather for, strong force. This one is much weaker, right? Uh, one, uh, it, uh, this is carried by this coefficient. I mean, if you have two wires, it's not that they are, you know, switch on the current and they, they attract like crazy. They have this force, but it's not such a big deal. So that's why it was discovered much later. Why, if you have some charged things, you know, you have two charged spheres, they attract very strongly. Do you remember I mentioned to you that if, if, if the Earth and the Moon had just an excess of charge, I don't know, 10 to the minus something, they would attract much, much stronger than they do through the gravitational force, right? Uh, it's only the fact that all bodies are essentially with zero net charge is the only reason why we see the gravitational force, right? Because otherwise, we only see Coulomb force because it's much, much stronger. So this one is stronger than gravitational force, but much weaker than the electrostatic force. So it's a sort of intermediate stuff. So you see it, but uh, to see it, uh, you have to make an effort. So I'm plugging in this in there. So I get this term, and then this cube downstairs. So to make a, a, a long story short, I get that this force is proportional to this factor. Then I have to integrate along this loop to get the B field. And then the net force, I have to integrate over the other loop. So I integrate over the loop 1. I integrate over the loop 2, this factor here, ds1 cross ds2 cross r1 minus r2. And everything is divided by R1 minus R2. So you go around loop 1, you go around loop 2, you integrate this factor 1 over R square, and, and you get the net force. In fact, this could be written in a nicer form if you use one of the formula one of those formulas that I gave you, but uh, I know that you already know, that is if you have this famous, you see you have a triple vector product, those they pop up everywhere in this stuff, in this business. So, I mean, this is not very nice because it's a vector product of a vector product. It's nicer to take the scalar product pointing in the B direction, right, minus A dot B pointing in the C direction, OK? So if I do this, so I take this double product, I call A, B, C. I just, you see, I get the minus 
I1, I2 divided by C squared, this double integral, and then just the R minus, so just this factor here. ds1 dot ds2. So that's nice because you only have to take the scalar product of this of these two sections of the wire, take the scalar product, and then you simply integrate essentially the distance square, very similar to the Coulomb law, you see, it goes like one over r square along those paths, and then uh, the product of the currents, you get the force. Any objections? How did I get that uh, last step? You see that right away or I should uh, explain? Because this gives two pieces, right? Right? Uh, so A, B, C. So that is sort of this piece here. Because you see A, B, C. So A dot B is this term here. So it's this. Uh, that's why it has a minus. So what happened to this other guy? It's zero, right? But <laughs> why? Okay, so that's a homework. Just convince, I mean, it's trivia, but just convince yourself that I'm not just, uh, you know, I could have, maybe I, f I forgot, maybe there were two terms. Okay, so essentially in half an hour we have covered most of the magnetostatic chapter that I'm very happy because, I mean, there is not much else. Uh, you, you can do, again, an infinite number of exercises by drawing clever circuits. Uh, so let me give you just one. Well, it's part of the exercise to, <laughs> to derive the exercise. <laughs> It's in the book. It's not, it's not the theory that I developed. <laughs> so the exercise is this. So, so first, convince yourself that uh, what I wrote there is correct. Then just apply again these very simple things to what, what is the simplest example of what we just computed. What is the, the force between, so what is, what is, the force between two infinitely long wires, right? So is I take for, for so let, let's say one goes up and one goes down with the, with value. So this is the current here is one, I1, the current there is I2, the distance between these two wires, let's call it D. Okay, so what is uh, essentially, uh, what, what is the, in fact, because they are infinitely long, what is the force per unit uh, of length between two uh, parallel wires, conducting wires, conducting wires? Okay, clear? So that's the exercise. I also verify w w when, when is this force attractive and when is repulsive, depending on the, you know, if the current is going in the same direction or in the opposite direction, okay? So this was really Orsted experiment. Uh, that's the place where they first discovered that uh, currents uh, were, were attracted or repulsed by some mysterious force that now we know to be essentially uh, due to the magnetic field. <coughs> can I, can I read? Okay, so what, what, uh, what, what can we do now? Well, uh, if you remember, uh, in electrostatics, it was a big deal the fact that we wrote the equations by using the scalar potential, right? If, uh, at the end of the day, we, we, the entire discussion of electrostatics boiled down to discussing the Laplace uh, or the Poisson equations, and that equation was based on the uh, scalar potential, not the electric field. 
So one may wonder, uh, can I do something similar here? I mean, it was nice not to have to worry about this vector field that was the electric field and to worry only about uh, the, uh, the, sorry, the, the, the scalar quantity that I call the, the scalar potential. So maybe the same trick, can I have the same trick here? Well, clearly I cannot use, I mean, there the trick was based on the fact that the, the curl of the electric field vanished, right? But that clearly is not going to work here. So it, it looks like we are out of luck. But of course our eye goes to the next line and okay, the curl is not vanishing, but now we have the divergence vanishing. And as you well remember, if you have a, if that was an exercise, uh, if you have a vanishing divergent field, that means that field itself can always be written as the curl of something else, right? Okay, so not exactly what, uh, what, we, w w what we wished, but the next best thing is uh, that we can replace the B field by the curl of another field. So it doesn't look like a breakthrough, but uh, I mean, it's the only thing we can do. So let's see what, wh where we go from here. So I can take this and replace it in the other equation, right? So I take the curl of the curl of A. Huh? And this is equal to minus mu naught J. Now again, this is a curl of a curl. So again, we are in this situation of A cross B cross C. So you see how useful that formula is. So, well, what happened? I use again that formula, and in this case, I get that the, the, the gradient of the divergence of A, right, the first term, minus, now here I have the, the diverge uh, of the gradient, so this is the Laplacian of A equal to mu naught J. So that's encouraging, in a way, because this part here, looks very much like uh, the, the Poisson equation. The only difference is that you don't end up with one Poisson equation. You end up with three, equa three Poisson equations, one for each component of this vector field. Okay, so the B field is more complicated. So instead of having one Poisson equation, you are going to have three Poisson equations because you have to rebuild first this, uh, this field A. By the way, this field A is called the vector potential that in a way is not a great name because potential should be a scalar quantity, but uh, okay, it's a vector potential, you understand why, because if you know A, then you know B. So this part is good, is a, is, a, is a Poisson equation for this vector potential, really three, because it's a vector. But uh, uh, how about this? I mean, this, this, we don't like it very much, sure. but uh, uh, there is a thing, that is called uh, gauge invariance of these equations that uh, we are going to discuss uh, uh, in, in a little while. But uh, so just take it for, 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 uh, mm, uh, for, for, uh, for what it is. Then we, that uh, you can make a choice of gauge, it's called. And in particular, this choice is that I take this uh, and I put it equal to zero. So I take that, uh, you see this A field is not completely fixed, right? Because if, if, if I shift it by certain combination, then it's still true that uh, the curve doesn't see this fact, then you get the same V field, okay? Huh? Right. But uh, it's really a, an important thing. So I, I don't want to discuss it now that we are doing another thing. We will stop and discuss this in full detail because this gauge invariance is crucial, okay? It's a, an invariance that you can shift your scalar potential and the vector potential by some functions and still the Maxwell equation, that is the value of A and B remains the same. You remember I, I mentioned this because 
uh, people, so then uh, they think that the E and B are physical, why A and phi, so the potential are not physical because you can shuffle them by this gauge transformation, so they, ca it cannot, be, they cannot be physical. But okay, we, we come back to that because uh, actually, uh, also it has a very profound uh, uh, consequence in, in, uh, in modern physics because this fact that uh, the Maxwell equations uh, are uh, gauge invariant, that is, that, that you can do a gauge transformation, uh, they don't change, is the, the, the basis of all unification of interactions uh, uh, in, at the quantum level, okay? So, so it's very important, this gauge invariant. So I want to discuss it uh, in some more detail uh, later on. But it now is a side issue. I mean, I know that I can change A by a, a, a certain transformation in such a way to satisfy the fact that A is a divergence-less field, okay? And if this is true, this is good because I get rid of this term A. Indeed, I have that uh, the vector potential satisfy this uh, three uh, Poisson equation. So this is true in the Coulomb gauge. So, so this particular choice of gauge is cool, called Coulomb gauge, I guess, because in a way, you know, this is like the Coulomb law, you remember, because, it, and so this is called the Coulomb gauge because then your potential satisfy uh, the same Poisson equation as the scalar potential. Okay, so we are making some progress here because this we already discussed, right? I mean, uh, we, we already know that uh, to solve that uh, equation, I can use various techniques. Uh, 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 in particular, I know that, uh, okay, component by component, this is exactly like the Poisson equation for the scalar potential. So I already know the solution, right? The generic solution, forget about the boundary condition for the moment, is just... Uh, uh, the integral of this current uh, in, in the volume divided by the usual factor R prime. Exactly like the potential was this integral over the charge density, right? Because here I had the charge density before. Now I have the current. So, but, I mean, that's a, it's a very incremental increase in difficulty is just I have three components because A is a vector, but each of those components has a solution of a, exactly the same Poisson equation that I had previously in the electrostatic uh, situation. Uh, uh, instead of having the charge density, I have the, the current density in that direction, okay? So everything seems very, of course this is, I, I still have this sort of gauge invariance, so I can always add here the the gradient of a scalar function, okay? But uh, by fixing the gauge, I fix that scalar function, and in particular with this gauge, this is the full solution of this equation, okay? Because I, fi I fix the gauge, eh? this is the terminology, okay? Is this clear? I mean, this, this, this equation, has, I can always add here <coughs> the, the, the gradient of some scalar function simply because then this is uh, is not uh, but if I have this uh, so but if this has to satisfy this this is the generic solution but then it has also to satisfy this condition that means that this scalar function this uh, term here must uh, satisfy uh, the, the fact that this is equal to zero right because to satisfy that, I take the divergence of the gradient, so I get back the Laplace equation. Now, this has to be true everywhere, and so the Laplace equation has only the constant solution equals zero. That is probably what you had in mind before I introduced this boundary conditions being. So indeed, in the Coulomb gauge, this is the generic solution of the Poisson equation.
it's zero really because I take it to be zero at the border. So it's zero at the border, it's a constant, has to be zero everywhere. What is the sign? The sa is yeah. Because uh, you see, the bo the boundary here means infinitely away, so I don't want anything there. That's the usual assumption that the universe factorizes things. If you if you have if you did you go to this Arcania made lectures? He, he, the last lecture he mentioned this uh, thing that uh, you always assume that uh, if you are doing something here, it is not changed by something that you are doing very far away. This is the same thing. If you take your border, your boundaries are infinitely away, there everything must go to zero, right? So this one is infinitely away? Yeah. The, it, what the, the color? Yes. And then corresponding right in the middle, right side of the middle, you just write right there. No, yeah, I mean, it, it can be, no. Uh, but uh, then I, I, I want that to satisfy the Coulomb gauge. Then uh, it must uh, satisfy the Laplace equation. So to satisfy the Laplace equation and to vanish at the very far away, then. Uh, these are surface terms that are always sort of put to zero. Remember, every time we do this integration by parts, right, we always have these bo border terms, the surface terms, and we always assume that everything is smooth and goes to zero sufficiently fast that we don't have to worry about those. Otherwise, it's, um, of course, it's, well, that's not, not always true. Uh, so what is the, the vector potential for, for the previous problem uh, that uh, we, we compute what is the B field for a, a loop? Uh, so w back to the previous problem, we, we have our nice loop in which uh, a, a, a current I runs, right? So if we take a, a small section of this loop and we go to a point P uh, here, what is the magnetic field there? Well, we already solved this problem using the Biot-Savart law, but now we can solve it by using the, the general solution of the Poisson equation for the vector potential. Because you see that, uh, so my vector potential, now I erase it, so I have to write it back. What is it? Uh, it was mu naught for pi j r prime d3 r prime r minus r prime, right? So now I, I so this is true for any distribution of, 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 of density of currents, but now I pick again a very special ca case. So what is the, there j d3 uh, r prime is what, uh, is, uh, is uh, say j so say this wire has a cross section S D S, right? So D S is this and S is the cross section. So that means this integral is J times the cross section times this D S. But J times the cross section is just nothing but the, the current, right? Going through. Everything is uniform and constant. So if I multiply the density of current times the cross section. I get the, the total current going through that wire. So, so you see, it simplify uh, to just uh, mu naught divided by four pi. Then I only have to integrate i ds. And then I have this distance here that I can just call r. So I have the integral over r uh, over r. So this is the <coughs> vector potential of this uh, of this loop 
this conductor loop. And then I can just use the fact that, so what is B? Well, I should get back my previous result. And to, I, if I take the curl of A, that is the curl of mu naught over 4 pi, the integral of I dS over R, I should get back uh, what I had before. And, uh, uh, and that's what I get. So I can call R. Uh, so let's call uh, R, well, I call it R. So let's call R dS2. So R12, if you want, if I call this uh, 1 and this 2, R12 square. When you take this, uh, so uh, <coughs> that is what we had before. So, uh, as you usually, this is the, the the standard procedure. You 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 find the vector potential, and then from the vector potential, you get the 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 the, the B field. As for the electrostatic problems, where you compute the potential, and then uh, you compute from that uh, the electric field. So, in most cases, it's easier to compute the the this. Uh, uh, this uh, vector potential. So clearly, the next step uh, is, uh, uh, so you may wonder what, uh, I mean, uh, what uh, this uh, multiple expansions that we did for the electrostatics, how about here? Well, clearly, we have a multiple expansion here too. And actually, I in a way, it's simpler because already you know that the leading term of the multiple uh, expansion is zero because there is no mo magnetic monopole. So the next step here is what is the uh, magnetic dipole? So before we do uh, that, uh, do I, before I erase that, of course I need that uh, one more time, but Well, that is, is well. Uh, before doing that, uh, let's uh, uh, remember that uh, I compute the uh, uh, energy of the electrostatic, uh, uh, the potential energy of an electrostatic field. You remember, it was some uh, integral over the volume of uh, uh, the electric field square. Okay, so the 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 potential energy density is the electric field square. What is the magnetostatic uh, potential energy? This is important, I mean, because uh, when we turn on the full Maxwell equations, then we are going to ask ourselves how the energy is organized in this field. Is flowing from the fields to the particles, and there is conservation of the energy. So we are going to use this concept. So we need, we know the electrostatic potential energy. So how about the 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 now the magnetic energy has to be a volume over some potential energy density that is the product of the current times the potential, vector potential. This is the, okay? But therefore, we can rewrite this in terms of the, uh, I want to rewrite this uh, in terms of the, of the uh, B field, okay? Uh, and to do that, uh, I need uh, Maxwell equations because you see J, right? This I can rewrite as well here. So let me put back the one over epsilon naught c squared. That comes out nicer here. So this term here is epsilon naught c squared divided by two, the integral of okay J. I can replace replace by the curl of B dot A. 
integrated over a certain volume. And this is also b dot the curl of a by going around. But the curl of a is b, right? So you see the density of energy for uh, static magnetic potential energy is, again, similar to what we got for is proportional to the square of the magnetic field. So at this point, we can say that the total potential energy for static, electric, and magnetic fields is given by this en density energy that is the square of the E field plus the square of the B field, OK? So that's just by using this uh, <coughs> Maxwell equation and the definition of the potential energy. So that's just uh, store it away somewhere. It will come back shortly when we start discussing the conservation of the energy for the electromagnetic field. And now we have time to uh, to go to this magnetic moment business. And, and that's, uh, so what is the magnetic, magnetic moment of some charges, some currents, really? Well, again, uh, we can just use the, we, we just solved the, the Poisson equation, right? So we just use the solution uh, for, for, the, for what we, we need. So here again, I'm in this Gauss unit, and I write for this solution, right? And remember what we did for the multipole expansion. Uh, what you want is to expand this 1 over r. Then you, you look very far away from, uh, so you have some currents here, right, in the volume V prime. And, and you look at this current distribution at the distance r, and r is uh, much larger than the typical size of this volume, r prime. So you want to expand the, the 1 over r minus r prime, exactly as we did uh, before. So you remember that was the term 1 over r, the leading one. Then you had the term like uh, this with the cube, and then uh, quadruples and so on, but stop here. So if I do that and I include it in my integral, I get 1 over C, okay? I get this current J uh, Maybe it's easier to do it. Uh, so let, let me write the component. I, the vec this is a vector. So let me write the i component. So I put the a, a, a i qu the, It's nicer this way. And then I put this expansion, right? 1 over r plus r dot i dot r cubed plus whatever d 3r prime. You see that th this this would be the the <coughs> this would be the monopole, but it's not there, right? And uh, uh, you see, this is the volume integral. Another way to see that it's not there is that you see, if you take the continuity equation for the constant case, I mean, this is 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 equal minus the cha change of charge. But clearly, here the charges are all fixed. So you have the divergence of the J is equal to 0. And that's another way to see the dispersed monopole term vanishes. Of course, it vanishes. The, the reason is 
because of this Maxwell equation, as we said. But uh, another way to, to see that is uh, so you are left with this uh, term here. So let's the R cube term. So you, you can pull out the R cube. It does not depend on the R prime. Uh, and you are left with the integral of the I component of J in R prime, R dot R prime, D three R prime. And then again, you have to use some uh, gymnastic with these vectors. So let's see what I did. Uh, you take R dot R prime times J. Here you have J, right, this component. And this you can always write. So this is, is a, you see, you can, this time you go back to the vector, to the, you see, this looks like one of those terms of the triple vector product, right? Because the triple, so let me write it, and then you recognize it. This is equal to r dot j times r prime minus the triple product, vector product of r cross j, right? So I'm writing the other way around. Usually we, we expand this in terms of this scalar product, but you can also do the other way around. And why is this useful? Because under integration, you see this one becomes minus 2 r dot r prime j. So that it can be taken on the other side <coughs> to produce a, a, okay, a common, let me write it, r 2 c r cube cross the integral of r prime cross j r prime that you still have to integrate over the volume so mm? so this one can be replaced by this one with a factor of 2 that goes here and then you have this triple vector product Now, if I define, so clearly, if I define this to be, so this I is what should be the magnetic moment, right? So I define the magnetic moment to this, this integral. You see, it's, it, it looks like, a, you know, the electric dipole moment was R times the charge, right? Here, clearly, cannot be the same thing. It's really the vector product of the R times the density of current. So I call this M, actually usually uh, 1 over 2C, this is called M, okay? So that uh, finally the, the, this, uh, 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 this uh, A is equal to this magnetic moment times R, which is this. You see I flip those around, so the minus goes away, divide by R cubed. Okay, is this clear or you're getting tired? W what is not clear? So here I use again this trick of, of rewriting some vector. So this was the, this vector product, this, this looks like the same. So I get the factor of two. So this is this tri triple product divided by two. So this is the two, this is the triple product. Then this uh, looks nice because you see I can write it as R cross something. This something I call it the magnetic, so this is the magnetic moment of this uh, density of charge. So this is the leading uh, term in this general solution of the uh, vector potential for some distribution of, of uh, uh, of elementary currents uh, in, in this volume. And then what can we do? So why is this useful? Well, as much as the electric dipole moment was useful because it's the leading term there. Uh, uh, if you have an arbitrary distribution, then the, the most important term is, is going to be this. 
then you have higher order terms like uh, we had in electrostatics, but hopefully if the distance is large enough, those other terms are subleading, so you can roughly describe the situation in these terms. Actually, there are many, uh, many uh, applications of this magnetic moment uh, in, in different situations. We will see just one in a second. But first, uh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll give you another exercise for Monday. So we have the, we have the, uh, the, the vector potential, so homework. So what is the B field? You have, uh, you have A, so if you take a curl, and I if you are persistent, uh, you get the magnetic field. So please verify that indeed the magnetic field looks very much like the, the, the electric field for 3N, uh, N, So it's, okay, with R. If you put R cubed downstairs, it's like this, okay? So the, the magnetic field in R due to this uh, uh, vector potential, so it's just a matter of taking the curl, so, but uh, may require some, uh, some work. So what is the magnetic moment for, for a little loop of current, right? This is a very simple uh, current distribution. So take a little loop uh, with surface area included, I mean defined by the loop to be A, okay? So M, this... Uh, This was the homework. This uh, magnetic moment, well, I just used the definition. So it, it was 1 over 2C, right? The integral of R, so the magnetic moment here at the distance R from the center of some point uh, of, of this loop. It doesn't matter because I'm really far away. Uh, we said that is R cross J R prime D R prime. So if I have this little loop with the current I, again, uh, it's like uh, the density. I can rewrite it like 2C. Uh, then I have uh, the integral of R Uh, the integral over R prime uh, I ds prime, right? Because this is D3, then the, this 3 becomes just the integral of, uh, of that. So that I can pull it out, I over 2C, and I'm left with this integral R cross D R. But you see what, you remember what this, uh, if you, you remember Kepler's law, that uh, the, the, the area span by uh, the uh, aerial element is just one half R ds, right? If ds is this, the, the elemental area 
So you see, you can write this integral uh, just like uh, it's 1 over c, then 1 half r dr is dA. So when you integrate, you get the entire area included in this circuit. And what is the direction of this? Well, it has to be the, the because you see it's r dr, so it's r dr, so it's pointing outside its norm to the little surface identified. So this is the magnetic moment of a little loop, uh, uh, of a little loop uh, of current, okay? So it's the elemental magnetic moment. So here you can do a homework, or maybe we do it together, and then we stop as an, as a, an example. Because you see, by, by going, by following this line of reasoning, uh, if you take a, a charged particle moving along some little loop, so take a charged uh, particle with a given, so, well, let, let's do it this way. Take a charged particle moving in a central force field. So it's moving in a central force field uh, at a certain distance r from the center of this force, okay? So it's like this, r dr. Uh, so uh, so the, again, I, I, you can use the, the area law, right? The total area spanned by this is some integral from one point to the other. And this, you remember, uh, it's... Uh, uh, is the angular momentum dt. Or, in other words, if you integrate this, this is constant, right, because it's a particle moving in a central force field, so I hope you still remember that the angular momentum is conserved. So this is just a constant, the angular momentum, so you can pull it out. And then you have to integrate over dt, but what is the integral over dt? This is the period of the motion in this central force, right? So the time it takes to the particle to come back. Think that it's moving on a circle or a, a lifting motion, some closed motion in this uh, central force field, okay? Now you see that uh, uh, the, the magnetic moment, we just uh, uh, said that it was, uh, I didn't, uh, there I think I, yeah, in fact I forgot the, the guy is gone. The magnetic moment of a little loop, uh, uh, it was like this, but a, a, a charged particle moving in a closed orbit is like a little loop carry carrying what? A current, an electric current that is the charge divided by the period, right? The charge comes back, that's the electric current in that uh, ideal loop uh, provided by this charged particle in a, in, a, in a central force field. So I can, you see, I can use this result for the magnetic moment to rewrite. So the magnetic moment of this charge moving in a central force in a central field uh, uh, is, uh, I can use that formula, uh, is I divided by C, right, times A. And what is the, the angular momentum is exactly, you see, you can write the norm of this uh, as, a, sorry, as the, right, because the angular momentum of this particle comes this way. And the norm, the unit vector is just, uh, I can write it as L divided by the size of that. So this is M. So I just rewrote that formula. Now, I use this result for, for the area, right? And the fact that the current is Q <coughs> divided by the period. So let's collect everything. It's Q divided by CT, the period. And I have this L divided by 2M, this term here. Then I have the period again, so it nicely simplifies. Then I have this uh, norm vector, no, sorry, uh, like this. Okay, so this, is, this goes away, and this goes away, 
So in, uh, it have Q divided by 2MC, 2MC, Q divided by 2MC times the angular momentum. Okay? That's really nice. The magnetic moment of a charged particle moving in a, in a central field uh, is proportional to the angular momentum of the particle with a fixed coefficient that only depends on the ratio between the charge and the mass. In fact, this is ratio is very important uh, 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 because, you see, it's characteristic of the particle. So if you give me the particle, you see the mass and the charge of the particle, then they will move with, they will just have all the same magnetic moment. If you, so let, let's make a, a step further. Let's quantize the angular momentum for the hell of, uh, okay, so if we assume that L comes in some quanta of multiple of uh, Planck's constant, then uh, you see that uh, the particle has a, a, a it has a, the magnetic moment of this particle comes in multiple of a new constant that is QH. So here I get N H bar. So I get QH bar 2MC, right? And this you must know what is, what, what's that? Bohr magneton. So, I mean, that's the re-derivation, the way you derive Bohr magneton. That is the magnetic moment of a particle going around. Uh, for instance, uh, I mean, this central force could be the, the force field uh, generated by the, a proton, right? Uh, and then uh, the electron going around will have uh, that magnetic moment. That is some multiple of Bohr magneton, QH bar divided by 2MC. OK. Questions? If not, uh, I think I stop here because uh, now uh, I finished what I wanted to say about magnetostatics. So uh, next time we start with the full set of Maxwell equations and, and, and we move on from there.